Greetings, Vale Johnson here. I'm going to be on the Extraordinary Bass Player Show with my man Sharon, and we're going to have a lot of fun and talk about a lot of different things. Well, welcome back. Welcome back to the Extraordinary Bass Player Show. As you know, I'm, <laughs> yay! <laughs> As you know, I'm your host, Sharon Moore. You know, I always say today, today, today. Well, family. As I've said before, my guests today don't need an introduction. I tell you, we can easily just go right to the end of the script. <laughs> As he's doing, go get a cup of coffee. Credits, what can you say? He's played with such people as Herbie Hancock. We'll talk about Kenny G for over 33 years. Stevie Nicks, George Benson. I definitely want to talk about MC Hammer. Yeah. He's a, oh, yeah. He's a songwriter. He's a studio musician. He's a producer. His TV work is awesome. We'll talk about the Arsenio Hall show and so much more. Would you help me welcome my guest today, Bill Johnson? Hey, uh, <laughs> How you doing, brother? I'm doing well, thanks. I appreciate that, man. I mean, it's, uh, just cruising along out here in Nashville now, you know? That Nashville is something else. I've been down there a couple of times, and the hospitality down there, man, that good old country hospitality, you can't beat it. Yeah, yeah, it is cool. It's a, it's a nice place to be right now, I think, yeah. But as we move on here, don't you miss some of the L.A. palm trees and miss the sun and all that cold weather down there in the winter? No, no, I like I like the seasons, actually. So I, I, I prefer the weather here. I really do. I got tired of that same old just sun every day, you know, because, you know, I'm a I'm a Swedish person, so... Uh, you know, the cool weather is good for me. I, I like that. I can actually wear pants, you know, because it's cold out. <laughs> you, know? you know, in L.A., it's like I, I feel like I have to live in shorts and a tank top. And, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work in every situation, you know, but it's just hot for me, man. <laughs> now, let me go back. Where are you originally from? Uh, well, born and raised in Seattle from uh, Swedish parents. Yep. I got here that. You started being playing bass with you have seven brothers and everybody is musically inclined, but that it was something about the Beatles and the bass guitar with the Beatles that influenced you. Tell us that story. That's it. That's it. Exactly. Well, well, um, yeah, I've got s six older brothers and all of us were professional musicians, at least at some point, if not for our entire careers. And uh, our mom was a professional musician and her mom was as well. And so. But the Beatles thing, I remember um, when I was when I was probably I don't know ten ten years old, something like that. Heard uh, heard some there was some Beatles music playing on the radio, something like that. And for some reason, at that point, the bass lines that Paul McCartney was playing just stood out to me as as something extraordinary. It just grabbed my attention. And I'm like, oh man, I want to. That that is really cool. I want to do that. And we had an old guitar sitting around the house, an old acoustic guitar, not even tuned up. I had no idea about how what tuning even meant. But I'm sitting there figuring out the notes, and I'm sure it's all out of tune. So I'm doing all kind of weird fingers, but figuring out the notes to these Beatles songs. And it was it was that that got me into playing bass. Was uh, listening to Paul McCartney's uh, bass lines because they were really you know they are really lyrical. You know, melodic bass lines are not just root heavy things. You know, he plays some, they were just really interesting to me. So that's kind of what got me started really interested in bass. Have you ever met Paul to tell him that story? No, man, I, I wish I could. That would be pretty cool, but I never have, no. Wow, that would be cool. What you got in that cup, man? You got any white lightning in that cup? Or gin, what? gin and juice in a, in a <laughs> coffee cup. I thought you had something in there, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the high school years. What was the bass and, and so forth for you like in the high school? Did, did you do the school band? Did you get out and start gigging by that time? Yeah, yeah. Well, well the the music programs in Seattle were really great, and that, that was a huge help to me because even in – even in elementary school, you know, you know, I started out, I was playing trumpet at the time, started in fourth grade. So I was in the, you know, the concert band in elementary school and played in junior high as well, you know, so, and so that's where I learned how to read music. So that was a big help. It was easy to learn how to read, you know, bass clef after that. 
And then when high school came around, I was in a band. We actually had a trumpet and a tenor sax player. And so we're playing uh, Tower Power and Chicago tunes and Blood, Sweat and Tears and stuff like that. And uh, and playing playing gigs around, you know, and and, uh, and having a good time. And then by the time I got out of high school, summer out of high school, I started playing uh, professionally. And it was actually with two of my older brothers that had uh, that owned a bar downtown in C uh, Pioneer Square in Seattle, a place called uh, Blue Banjo, and it was called Doc Maynard's by then. But yeah, we're playing every, you know two nights, the, the weekends every night, every weekend, and uh, and just didn't look back from there. That's all I ever wanted to do was play music, man. So that's that's kind of what happened. Yeah, who were some of your influences back then? Well, you know. Obviously, I, I got really interested from you know hearing Paul McCartney play. But my early, my the, my earliest uh, the earliest music that I loved, I was uh, big into Led Zeppelin and Emerson Lake and Palmer, and Yes, and Kansas. And it was because all of those bands had really great bass players that played interesting parts that weren't just dum 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 dum. You know that that thing. I hate that. I, I never liked that. <laughs> And so I always liked, you know, the, these the, these heavy rock bands, but were bassists were really musicians, you know, and uh, and it wasn't until I got out of high school, I started going to the University of Washington. There was it, it was this was a moment that changed the trajectory of my my career. I'm at a at a party, so this is 1977, right? I'm at this party, and somebody, you know, I hear this song come on the stereo and it blew me away i'd never heard this sound i'd never heard this kind of thing before and i i immediately start running around the house trying to find the record player so i could see who it was and it was graham central station it was larry graham and i remember the song it was turn it out we're gonna turn it out turn it out baby you know the bass line boom 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 and i heard that and i go what the hell is that how was he making that sound i'd never heard that and so I got into the into Larry Graham and got into the slap style and trans transitioned from you know the hard rock thing and put all my energy into the into the funk and R and B stuff and it really came natural to me. I kind of you know I I hadn't been exposed to it at all in my life, but as soon as I was, it's like I took to it, and it was something that was really really it made sense to me, and I just loved that style of playing. So I got into all of that all of the funk stuff at that point, you know. So Larry Graham, man, Larry Graham was huge. And then, and then uh, Stanley Clark comes next, you know, after that. And at the, right about the same time, I really took a deep dive into Tower Power. And so I was a little late to that party because they were, you know, they were around since, what, 1970 or something, 72. I got there a little bit late, but I got into, into Rocco's bass playing with Garibaldi. It was just magical to me. So I got into all of that stuff. And... Uh, and from then on, it was, you know, I kind of, though all those things blended together with the hard rock stuff and kind of my own style kind of came out of that. Yeah. Veil Johnson, the Veil man, I call him. Uh, we were doing Keb Mo. We toured the world, basically. We were all over the place. But uh, Veil is a monster. Uh, I remember walking into rehearsal, my first time in a Keb Mo rehearsal. It was in, I think it was in Nashville. And Vail played a lick. And I'm like, what planet is he from? How'd he get that lick in there like that? <laughs> but uh, he's amazing, man. He just, he's rock solid. He plays on the one. His timing is great. And you know what? He's a showman. Yes, he is. He can, he can, he can do some flashy stuff if he wants to. But when he wants to lay back, he can lay back. So he's really an amazing bass player. And it was fun working with him. And hopefully I get a chance to work with him again. Yep. Peace. What was your first big tour? Who was your first big tour? The first big one was Kenny G. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let's talk a little bit about the Arsenio Hall show. Yeah. How did that come about? Man, well, you know, I had, we had played, I played on Arsenio a couple times with, with Kenny. And Arsenio really liked the stuff I was doing. He enjoyed, you know, the slap bass stuff. And so he, I, I met him, I did, I hadn't met him in person until he came to a Universal Amphitheater in Los Angeles and we're playing there and he was backstage after. And uh, he asked me to come and be, a, you know, the a musical guest on the show. And so I came in and did that, you know, a number of times, you know, he just, you know, production team, you know, calls me up and says, Hey, yeah, our would like to come play next week, you know, whatever, you know, Thursday night, come on out, you know. Yeah, let's talk about the bass. Okay. What do you look for in a drummer? And what do you anchor yourself to? I know a lot of bass players would say they anchor this. Well, why should I say, what do you anchor yourself to in the in in the uh, drummer? A right. lot of bass players would say the kick drum. I even yeah, had one guy it. say the hi hat. What do you yeah. look for in a drummer as a bass player? And what do you anchor yourself to as a bass player to the drummer? Well, as far as far as the anchor parts, easy. It's the the feel is all in the hands. The foot is nothing to me. The foot is meaningless. And uh, uh, Mr. Ed can go like this. You know, you say two plus two. Mr. Ed can play a kick drum. You know, the foot is nothing. The feel is all here. So it's whatever you're playing with your hands. And when I, when I have in, in, in my monitor, uh, you know, I have everything that your hands hit and nothing that your foot is hitting. <laughs> you know, you know I've, I've, got, I've got a lot of ride cymbal, a hi-hat, all the cymbals, you know, a bit of snare, some of the toms, and the foot I never need. I don't have it in my monitor ever because... If the foot isn't in time with the hands, you're screwed anyway. So I'm the feel for me is in the hands, man, and the the foot will be there. So I don't I don't want to listen to that. I don't want to listen to that. I'm listening to the hands. I want to hear every little every little ghost note. Every, you know, if you're dragging the snare, I want to hear every boom. You know, I want to hear all of that. You know, and it it's something. It's a pet peeve of mine. It drives me crazy in groups that I work with. The guys. The guys with the worst time in the band always have just kick and snare in their monitors. Bill, let me ask you this one. What's your least favorite key to play in and why? Wow. You know, I would have to say that I don't have a least favorite because they're all different. They all they all offer something there are different things available in every key so I, you know i i look at it you know some keys are certainly more difficult i mean are you talking about just just for playing in general or for like sight reading or just just playing in general yes yeah you know I, if i had to pick one i would say d flat because that's that sits in the weirdest position for for bass, I think. But it still wouldn't bother me because it's like, you know, all along everybody, you know, early on in my, in my playing, people would always assume that, you know, oh, you want to do a little bass solo? If a funk bass solo, it's got to be an E. And I would resist that, and I would tell them, no, no, don't. It doesn't have to be an E. You make it in G. Make it in B flat. I don't care. I, I'll do something different in each key because there are limitations, but I, I, I don't look at the limitations. I look at, okay, there's something else available. I can actually do this other thing in A flat that doesn't sound as good if I played the exact same thing in E, you know? So I don't need to have that low droning note. It's like, no, make something else happen. So, you know, I, I like, I'll take any key as far as playing in, or or a solo in it doesn't it doesn't matter to me. Well, we do a thing on the show we call word of advice. Well, okay. I, ask, I ask the artists that they will leave a parting word or words. 
for the up and comer bass player. Even the guys are at the next level, but that are trying to get traction in this industry, in this game. Would you leave them a word or words of right. advice? Yeah, man, that's a, that's, that, that one's going to force me to think. I'm not sure if I've had enough coffee yet to really uh, think about that. That's a, yeah, that's a good one. It's, it's such a hard, it seems like such a difficult time for people coming up in, in the business right now. Whereas when, you know, we were coming up, there were so many more gigs to play, more opportunities, you know? So I, here's, okay, here's something that, I, that I've noticed in Nashville with younger players. And when I've been putting bands together for other artists and I have to deal with some younger people, uh, it seems like their work ethic, it doesn't, it doesn't match up with mine. So my word of advice to some, somebody coming up is do every gig that comes up, that is offered. Do every one, even if it pays nothing, even if you have to, heaven forbid, carry your own gear which is something that young people seem to be allergic to doing, carry your own rig, carry your own amp, have some great equipment, do every gig possible. Because in my experience, every good, every good opportunity has come from someone seeing me live, meeting me at a, playing live. It didn't come from, you know, hanging out or, as, or some sort of, uh, purposeful uh, networking deal. It's people want to see somebody play. They want to, they want to see you and hear you and you'll meet people that way. So do every gig possible and always make sure you bring your own gear if you have to, because you want to sound the best every single time. Well, tell me about around the world in 40 years. Is that right? Yeah, right. right. Tell me about that. Well, it's my, my solo show, my solo show, um, which I, I now I, I call it more basically incorrect. That's the name of my YouTube channel. But now that I, so, I call it basically incorrect with basically spelled with B-A-S-S, -S, of course, basically. Um, what it is, it's kind of a, it's part storytelling and part music. It's, it's music from all the people that I've worked with over all this time. And so what I'll do is I'll, I'll tell a story about a musician. I might, I might have a story to tell about, uh, you know, young MC or Stevie Nicks or Michael Bolton. I'll tell a story about my, you know, some of my experiences with that person. And I, and then I'll play one of their songs. I do it solo, kind of like, uh, like Ed Sheeran does with, with a looper and I sing and I play and I'll play like my version of, of, uh, you know, a Paula Abdul song or something. I might do it like a bossa nova, you know, like a different version. But so it's basically, it's talking about the artist and then I'll play a song that uh, I had either played with them or recorded with them, stuff like that. And, uh, these really bizarre experiences that I've had, I do that in my live show. Here's a question I usually ask the guests in closing. Well, what do you want your legacy to be, to be said, to be told? Well, oh, yeah, that's a great one. That yeah, legacy. You know, I, I think that um, that is such a hard question to answer. I, I think it would just be... Uh, you know, I would like for people to maybe just think, man, yeah, that that felt good, what he was doing. I like that. It made it made me feel good. That would be the that would be the biggest thing for me. That's awesome, brother. And that's what it's all about. That lasting impression of feeling. What did yeah. it do? How did it feel for me? Yeah, yeah. 
Now, let me say thank you so very much for being on the Extraordinary Bass Player Show. <laughs> That's been my pleasure. <laughs> I've been looking to meet you for years, man. I've seen your body of work and just amazing. You, they, they hire you to play bass and then you end up taking the show over. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Many a nights I've seen that. Oh, man. Hey, would you help us wave goodbye to all the fans? Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, my friend.